our milk cow jam just calfed at the end of August, and now we are swimming in milk. So I thought this would be the perfect opportunity to show you how we make all of our family's dairy products for a family of nine in about three to four hours each week. And this varies depending on which cheeses we're going to make. So some of the harder cheeses take a little longer, whereas if it's a busy week and we don't have time to be making those hard cheeses, then we can make the rest of our dairy products in about an hour or two. If you're new here, I'm Stacy, a busy homesteading and homeschooling mom of seven, going on eight. And although I really value from scratch meals and from scratch food, I don't have a ton of time to be in the kitchen. So I had to be really strategic about how I go about it. When it comes to processing milk, I can't be processing it daily. So this once a week method has really made it easy, streamlined and doable even for a busy family. Now, last fall, we did go and purchase a second fridge. We call it our milk fridge to make having all this milk on hand doable. But if that's not something that you are able to do at this point, you can do these projects one at a time through your week as you're able. And yes, you can make all these recipes with store-bought pasteurized milk. The only caution I would give you is since you're not going to be skimming your cream off the top of your milk, you're going to need to purchase cream separately. And unfortunately, a lot of cream from the store is what's called ultra pasteurized. And in my experience, ultra pasteurized does not perform the same. So it's not gonna do things like make butter. So if you can't find a local source of cream or cream from the store that's not ultra pasteurized, I would skip some of these recipes like making butter that just aren't going to work. The cheeses and a lot of the things will be just fine with that store-bought milk. And I will have this whole process written out in a blog post and I will link that below so you don't have to memorize any of these recipes. But this video is gonna be really helpful in showing you the process and then you can reference the blog post for all the details. Okay, let's get started. So today we will be making pumpkin spice creamer, yogurt, butter, cream cheese, sour cream, buttermilk, kefir, feta cheese, and gouda cheese, which is a quick aging hard cheese that our family loves. There are, of course, other dairy products that our family makes, such as whipped cream, ice cream, and other cheeses. For whipped cream, we just make more as needed using a whipped cream dispenser. You just add cream and whatever else you'd like to sweeten or flavor it. We like maple syrup and a little vanilla. And then it uses nitrous oxide to dispense the cream into whipped cream. The bummer is that you have to keep buying the cartridges, but we don't use it often, so it has been worth it. Ice cream is not a weekly treat, but I do have a video showing my favorite recipe and method, so I will link that below in case you're interested. And then as far as other cheeses, I'm making Gouda today, but next week it might be cheddar or something else. These all take a while to age, so I just like to be continuously making them so that then we have a constant supply of aged and ready to go cheeses for later. Quick cheeses like mozzarella and ricotta are not something I really like to make too far ahead of when I'm going to use them, so this is just something I would make during my dinner prep time. I do have a tutorial for making the easiest and best, in my opinion, mozzarella cheese, so I will link that below as well. One other disclaimer before we get started, I say it takes just a few hours of time, but of course fermented dairy and cheeses are not quick processes. The time referenced here refers to the hands-on time to get everything going. There are some later steps, but these are not something I have to set aside in my schedule. For example, removing the yogurt from the heat the next day and chilling it takes just a few minutes and is something I can easily do as we're eating breakfast and getting ready for our day. So please don't be disappointed when you see that there are a few extra steps beyond the span of one afternoon that must be done to finish those dairy products you created. Okay, let's get to it. I'm going to start by skimming the cream off of all but five gallons of milk, which you should leave as whole milk for the Gouda and yogurt, leaving about a one inch cream line on the remaining milk. As you can see, I don't have a whole lot of cream to skim on several of these jars, and that is because our cow is holding back her cream for her calf, so some might not even have that much. Let's just hope I have enough cream to finish these recipes. If you're using store-bought milk, I would use 2% for most of the recipes, whole milk for the Gouda, and then add heavy whipping cream where cream is called for. And also, I'm using a ton of milk here, but you don't have to make these things in these quantities, so don't stress out about that yet. I'll tell you how to adjust it as we go. Also, I should point out that the milk we drink or use on a daily basis is not skimmed. We just drink that as is because contrary to what many believe, full fat milk is actually the healthiest. 
Okay, so now I'm going to split up the cream into a pint for cream cheese, a pint for creamer, a quart for sour cream, and the rest for butter. Next, I'm going to get my milk warming for the Gouda, feta, and cream cheeses in separate pots. I'm doing a gallon here for the feta and four gallons for the Gouda, but I adjust these amounts depending on how much milk I have to work with. The recipes can easily be halved. The smaller pot for cream cheese gets two cups of milk and two cups of cream. I just put the temperature for each pot on medium and whisk occasionally, but the goal is to get the feta milk to 88 degrees Fahrenheit, the Gouda milk to 90 degrees, and the cream cheese milk to 86. A little side note here, I have pre-sterilized all of my cheese making equipment in hot water prior to this. While that milk heats up, I'm going to get my yogurt going in my Instant Pot. If you don't have one, you can do this over the stove, it's just a little bit more hands-on. I'm making a gallon, but adjust to your family's needs. I have a friend who makes a three to four gallons of yogurt at a time in a big roaster pan. After dumping the milk into the Instant Pot, all I have to do is put on the lid and hit the yogurt button until it says boil. This is going to bring it up to temperature, or at least get it close. We want to get it to 190 degrees, but I found that the yogurt setting gets it to about 180, so I'll show you how I deal with that in just a minute. The cream for butter is just going to get put in my KitchenAid mixer and turned on medium-low speed with the beater attachment on. It helps if the cream was allowed to sit at room temperature for about 20 minutes first. At this point, I'm going to check on the pots of milk heating on the stove, and my cream cheese milk should be about to temp. Keep a close eye on it and whisk frequently at this point so that it doesn't scald. When the cream cheese milk gets to 86 degrees Fahrenheit, remove it from the heat. Then add a quarter teaspoon calcium chloride solution to the milk if you're using pasteurized milk, and stir well. Sprinkle 1 8 teaspoon of mesophilic culture. I'm using MM100, and I'll put all of these notes in the blog post that goes with this, over the milk and let it sit for two minutes. Then stir up and down gently to combine well. Then add 1 8 teaspoon rennet diluted in 1 4th cup of water. Stir up and down gently to combine well. Cover and let ripen for four to six hours. You will know when it's ready when there's pools of whey developed on the surface and the curd mass begins to pull away from the sides. When your Instant Pot beeps to say it has reached temperature, it will say yogurt on the screen. Before you do anything else, skim off the film that has formed on the top and discard it. You don't want that mixed into your yogurt. Then I would use a thermometer to verify that it has reached 190 degrees. I usually have to set it on saute for a few minutes to get it to that temperature. Once it is to temp, remove it from the heat and set it aside to cool to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, which will take about an hour. If you have the time and like your yogurt really thick, you can also let it sit at 190 by hitting keep warm and putting the lid back on for 20 to 30 minutes before moving on to the next step of cooling it to 120, but this is optional. About this time, your pots of milk for the feta and gouda should be about to temp. Now keep in mind that the first time you do this, the steps are going to take a little longer, so you may find that you need to deal with one before the other. The order really doesn't matter, so just make sure you aren't losing track of the things that need your attention, and you should be able to bounce around and get them all done. When the milk for the feta gets to 88 degrees, add an eighth teaspoon mesophilic culture, MM100 is what I'm using, and one fourth teaspoon lipase. Stir up and down to combine well, cover and let sit for one hour. When the milk for the Gouda gets to 90 degrees, sprinkle a fourth teaspoon freeze-dried mesophilic culture, here I'm using M30, over the milk. Let it sit two minutes, then stir well. Add one fourth teaspoon rennet, diluted in a fourth a cup of water. Stir well using up and down motions to make sure it's mixed well with all of the milk. Let it sit for 30 minutes. It's not a huge deal if you're over by a few minutes, but the timers will help you gauge when to check on them better than guessing. Once the yogurt has cooled to 120 degrees, go ahead and skim that hardened layer off again and discard it. Then scoop two cups of the milk into a bowl and mix in six ounces of a previous batch of yogurt or six ounces of plain store-bought Greek yogurt that has live and active cultures. Whisk well, then whisk that mixture into the larger pot of milk. Put a lid on your pot. This one doesn't really fit the pot, but it's fine for this. 
Then wrap the whole thing in a big bath towel and place it in your oven with the light on for 10 to 12 hours. I have tried many different ways to incubate yogurt. I've kept it in the instant pot on yogurt mode. I've put it in a cooler. Really, they all get the job done, but this method is pretty easy and consistent. Okay, everything is now in a waiting period. As your butter churns, you will see it go from cream to whipped cream to butter. It takes a bit, so be patient and be glad that the mixer can do the hard work for you. If your cream has separated into butter and whey, it's time to finish that project. Strain it under cold water, massaging to remove all of the whey. The whey can be fed to chickens or pigs or used in other projects. Contrary to popular belief, the whey that comes from making butter is not anything like store-bought buttermilk. It can be cultured and used as such, but we generally like using regular milk than whey, and this is really just personal preference. Mix in some salt to taste. The salt also helps keep the butter fresh longer. Then roll the butter into balls and place in an airtight container in the fridge or freezer. There are also butter molds available on Amazon, and I'll link mine in the description. You can leave your fresh butter out at room temperature to keep it soft, but I will say that it develops a pretty strong taste pretty quickly, so I'd recommend using something like a butter bell if you go that route, and this is just a device that uses cold water to help keep it cool enough so that it doesn't sour too quickly. My Gouda has now sat for 30 minutes, so at this point, you should check for what's called a clean break. If not, let it sit five to 10 minutes more. Then it's time to cut the curds. Cut the curds horizontally, then vertically, in half inch strips. I then attempt to cut the curds in layers under the surface. This isn't a perfect process, so don't worry about that. You'll get better at it the more you do it. Just shoot for half inch cubes and try to be gentle. Then cover the pot and let it sit for five minutes. This is so that the curds can firm up a bit before the next step. Gouda is somewhat of a needy cheese, so we're going to continue with the following steps finishing the other dairy products as we have time. So for example, while you're in a period of letting the Gouda sit, you might notice that your butter is ready for the next step. When your timer for the feta goes off, go ahead and finish the final steps during a break from stirring the Gouda. You don't have to worry about things going a few minutes over. If your Gouda sits for 10 minutes instead of five, it's not going to change a thing. This flexibility allows you this ability to do all these projects simultaneously without stress. I'm going to show the rest of the steps for the Gouda in order now, just so that this tutorial doesn't get really confusing, but know that in real time I was doing the remaining projects simultaneously. Also, some of these steps are going to be for tomorrow and the days following. For a better idea of how to juggle things during this time, the blog post linked in the description will have a much more accurate timeline of how this all plays out. So you're going to stir for five minutes, breaking up any bigger chunks with your spoon. Be gentle because you don't want them to all mesh together. Then repeat the process, letting it sit for five minutes. Then stir for five minutes, then let sit five minutes more. Next, you're going to remove six cups of whey. Then replace the whey by adding in six cups of hot tap water. I just use a mason jar to do this. Stir 10 minutes while bringing the temp to 98 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Then let it sit for five minutes. Do the same thing, this time taking out about five quarts of whey. You should get down to where the tops of the curds are showing. Then replace the whey with hot water, the same as you did before. Next, stir for about 20 minutes more or until the curds gently cling together and have some firmness. They shouldn't feel like a poached egg white or slip through your fingers when you squeeze them, but they should still crumble apart when you want them to. You should not have to stir continuously, but about 60 to 70% of this time. So I'm usually back and forth with other things during this period of time. When you get to where you feel they are done, make sure the finished temperature is about 105 degrees. Continue stirring if they're not hot enough, then turn off the heat and let it sit for 10 minutes. Drain off the curds, and yes, I'm dumping this down the sink, Feel free to give it to animals or use it. I just have to pick where to spend my time at times, and today saving this way was not worth it. Then you can add in flavorings if you'd like by mixing spices in with the curds. You can do two tablespoons of whole cumin seed or red pepper flakes. Really, you can get creative here. Finally, scoop the curds into a cheesecloth lined press. 
and press with light pressure for 30 minutes. This cheese press has worked so well and I'm glad I made the investment, but there are DIY cheese press tutorials available online. How you work the press is going to vary based on what press you have, so I'll show you here how mine works, but adjusting the cheese molds and the pressure might be different for yours. Some of the DIY ones literally just hang heavy things from the top. Either way, it does take a little time to figure out what works best, so be prepared to experiment a bit the first few times. After the 30 minutes is up, flip the wheel of cheese, and then you're going to press it under medium pressure for eight to 10 hours. At this point when you flip it, the cheese should hold together pretty well. You'll still see the outline of the curds, but it shouldn't fall apart at all when you flip it. Also make sure you plan ahead for a lot of whey to come out so you don't come back to a huge mess. I'm usually finishing this up in the evening, so I just let it sit overnight. And then the next morning, or whenever that eight to 10 hours is up, you're going to make the brine. So you're going to weigh out 300 grams of non-iodized salt into a container larger than the cheese wheel. I like using this juice pitcher, but use whatever you have. Then add in 1,000 grams of hot water and whisk well to dissolve the salt. Add in 500 grams of cold water and whisk well again. Put the pressed wheel in the brine and let it sit for 10 hours. It will probably float up a bit and that's fine. Just make sure you bob it under the surface of the brine a bit so that there is salt sitting on the top. This is one reason why I really like using pink salt for this because I can see where it's at. I just use Redmond's Real Salt, but any salt will do. After that time is up, you will flip it in the brine and then let it sit 10 more hours. So for me, this usually looks like putting the cheese wheel in the brine in the morning, flipping it before bed, and then taking it out to dry the next morning. To dry it, take the cheese wheel out of the brine and put it on a plate or pan to air dry, flipping it two times a day until the rind feels mostly dry, but still a little bit clammy. You may have to drain off the liquid every once in a while so that this drying process can happen. When it gets to this point, you can vacuum seal and refrigerate it or put it in a cheese cave. We actually have a wine cooler for this purpose, but before we had that, we just used the fridge. I will say that it won't age as fast or become as flavorful at colder temperatures, so keep that in mind. Ideally, you wanna age Gouda at 50 degrees for the first month and 40 degrees after that. All right, I'm going to go through the remaining steps for the feta in the same way, but again, this was done alongside the other projects and then just finished up over the next few days in little pockets of time. So after the feta has sat for an hour, add one half cup cool water with a teaspoon of rennet mixed in. Stir well. Cover and let sit for 40 minutes. When the time is up, check for a clean break. If not, wait five to 10 minutes more. Then you're going to cut it into a grid just like we did with the Gouda. Let it sit five minutes to firm up a bit. Next, stir off and on for 40 minutes. I also use my cheese ladle to chop up any bigger pieces. Definitely use your timers so that you can juggle your other projects successfully. I'm usually going back and forth between cheeses here. After the 40 minutes are up, drain off the whey from the curds using a large piece of cheesecloth. Then tie the cloth and let it hang over a pot to drip for 24 hours. To finish the feta after it has been allowed to drip for 24 hours, sprinkle salt in the bottom of a baking pan. Slice the cheese into half to three quarter inch slices and put the slices in the pan, stacking to allow for air circulation. Salt between each layer as you stack them. Let it sit like that for a few days, draining off the whey and flipping the pieces. When slightly hardened on all sides, place in a container filled with a brine solution of three quarts water to seven ounces of salt. Make sure no cheese is sticking up from the brine. Refrigerate or place in a cheese fridge if available. 45 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit is ideal. The cheese will improve in flavor over the next few weeks, but it can be eaten at any time. If it's too salty, rinse it before serving. Okay, the next couple projects are just squeezed in when I have time while I'm making those more difficult cheeses. The next one up is kefir. Kefir is a cultured milk that our family really loves and once you have activated your milk kefir grains, it's as easy as straining them out of your previous batch and adding it to some more fresh milk. So here I'm doing just that and then covering the milk with a coffee filter and a rubber band and leaving it on the counter to culture. 
It is really that easy. In a few days, it will be ready to drink, and at that point, I'll start a new batch in the same way and sweeten it by blending it up with some strawberries and maple syrup and then refrigerating it. If this is your first time making kefir, follow the directions that came with your starter culture to activate them. Kefir is great added to smoothies or we just drink it plain too, and it is so good for you due to all of the natural probiotic strains. I'll put links in the blog post that goes with this with all of my favorite starter cultures. Cultured sour cream can be made using an heirloom buttermilk culture or a direct set sour cream culture. I prefer the latter so that I can use my sour cream as a starter indefinitely. Direct set requires a new purchased starter every time you make it. I have already started mine, so I just need to create a new batch of sour cream by adding one tablespoon of my previous batch per cup of cream to my fresh jar. You can also use cultured buttermilk as your culture at the same ratio. Mix well, cover with cheesecloth and a rubber band until set about two days at room temperature, then refrigerate. We make buttermilk in the same way that we make sour cream, but using milk instead of cream. So follow directions on your starter, or if it's already going, simply add three cups of milk to a clean jar, add one fourth cup of your previous batch of buttermilk, mix well, cover with a cheesecloth and a rubber band until set 12 to 18 hours at room temperature, then refrigerate. Okay, the next recipe I wanna show you is a pumpkin spice creamer, which may seem a little silly if you know that I don't drink coffee. My husband does, he puts it on his coffee, but I can't have any caffeine and my kids don't drink caffeine either. So they will actually put it on their hot chocolate, but my favorite non-caffeinated drinks lately have been this hazelnut tea. I just, um, actually someone told me about it on Instagram and I got it off of Amazon, I'll link it below. Zero caffeine, amazing flavor, and really good with this creamer. And then the other one that has been a staple for over a year now has been this Bengal Spice Tea. It's a wonderful, cozy drink. Um, it has more of like a chai flavor and is also really good with this creamer. Making homemade creamer is as simple as blending cream with your preference of sweeteners and flavorings. For my pumpkin spice recipe, I add to a blender three cups of cream, one fourth cup pumpkin puree, one teaspoon vanilla, one teaspoon pumpkin pie spice, and one fourth cup maple syrup. You could also do some chilled hot chocolate and a dash of peppermint for a peppermint mocha flavor. It's actually really fun to get creative with the flavors depending on what you're craving. If you aren't opposed to using it, sweetened condensed milk and a bit of vanilla are great too. After you have all of your ingredients, simply blend it up and then pour the creamer into an easy to pour bottle and refrigerate. I really like using repurposed bottles for this. This one that I'm using here is actually an old lemon juice bottle and it works great. When the yogurt is done, it should be firm and starting to pull away from the sides. If you like a really thick Greek yogurt, scoop it out of the pot into some cheesecloth to let it drain for a few minutes and then put it in your jars. And if you're fine with the texture the way it is, you can just put it in jars and then flavor it as desired. We like maple syrup and vanilla, or we just mix it with jam. After the cream cheese is done, it should also be strained in cheesecloth. I like to just set it in a colander on the top of a pot in the fridge for a few hours to do this, and then as soon as it's to your preferred consistency, it's done. So the bulk of this dairy making project was done over the course of an afternoon, but obviously there are tasks that were finished over the next few days. Don't let this overwhelm you. After these things become a part of your daily routine, they really don't add any extra time or effort than grabbing them from the store. It not only feels really good to make all of your dairy at home, especially if it's from milk from your family dairy cow, but it is also so much healthier than what you would get at your local store. I hope this inspired you to make some or all of your own dairy products. If food from scratch and homesteading is something you enjoy, make sure to subscribe and I'll see you here next week.